Good morning. The context we established last time, just to remind you, was that focus is self-regulation. And the alternative to focus is either drift or evasion. Drift is not bothering to regulate. Evasion is regulating in reverse, working to avoid awareness. Someone in the Q&A called it anti-management. And at the end, I promise to begin this time with an explanation of the relation between drift and evasion, and I will begin with that now. When a person drifts, he gets signals that he is doing something wrong. He can't avoid the uneasy sense, even if unidentified in words, that he is running blind. So a person who drifts a lot, sooner or later has to be evading those signals. I call this meta-evasion. Meta-evasion is second-order evasion, evading the signals that one is not using one's mind properly, that one doesn't know what the hell one is doing. As you know, ounce for ounce, evasion is a lot worse morally than drift. Evasion is the cardinal sin, even though drift is nothing to brag about. So when does drift amount to evasion? When does drift require meta-evasion? This is an interesting question, and I've developed the, the following answer. I think there is a distinction between just not answering the signals one gets and actively evading them. A state of drift is not proper, but if a man drifts for 30 seconds while riding the bus, that doesn't require that he actively negate the signals he is getting. The signals, after all, may not be very strong or urgent feeling. But there may come a point at which the contrast between what his mind is doing and what it ought to be doing is so glaring that to continue in the state of drift, he has to do something to silence the signals. Meta-evasion is silencing the signals that something needs attention and effort. Frequent, frequently, this is accomplished by rationalization. For example, of course I'm feeling something's wrong. It's because my boss yelled at me when that isn't the cause. Or there's no point in struggling to know because there are no answers anyway. The sentences one can use to rationalize are endless. Now maybe more accomplished evaders can just squash the signals directly by saying huffily to themselves, no in order to silence them. Remember the slogan of the arch evader, James Taggart, don't bother me, don't bother me, don't bother me. The target of his bark is not really Eddie Willers, but his own sense of guilt. Conclusion, drift and evasion are distinguishable, but only down to a certain level and only in the short term. A life of drift has to be sustained by evasion of what one is doing, by meta-evasion. I think that's why when Ayn Rand was asked in one question period at a Fort Hall forum, uh, she was asked about the difference between uh, drift and evasion, and she said something brief to the effect, there really isn't much difference, not in principle. Evasion is choosing an unjustified state, a state you know better to be in. Evasion is motivated. One ejects material from awareness on emotional grounds. One denies that something's real when it's real, or that it's important when one knows it ought to be considered. One doesn't want something to be real relevant or important when he knows clearly or dimly the contrary. So drift is not taking charge and evasion is taking charge in reverse. 
taking charge to make your mind do the wrong thing. Evasion is active and deliberate. It takes work to evade, as we saw last time. And that fact shows that effort, per se, is not synonymous with focus. Evasion does take effort, but it's certainly not focus. Evasion is deliberate, which is one reason why it is more evil than drift. The other reason why it's more evil than drift is that it is instituting anti-cognition, so it is more destructive to your mind than just not overseeing it, and more destructive to your life. You can think of the distinction between drift and evasion as being like the legal distinction between negligence and malice. A person is negligent when something bad happens because he didn't take the care he should have taken. But malice means the conscious intent to bring about the bad result. So drift past a certain point is meta-evasion because you are evading the responsibility of taking charge of your mind. And the certain point comes when you have to actively silence the signals you are getting, negate them, the signals telling you that attention is required. Okay, now let's apply this to the distinction we made last lecture between focus and concentration. When a more relaxed mental process, such as creative mulling, is rational, one is aware of the state one is in through self-monitoring, and of the relation of the material sent up by the subconscious, the relation of that to reality. In rational mulling, the material sent up by the subconscious is never taken as an unchallengeable given. Only the data of sense perception are the given. So the fact that a given idea occurs to you, say, while mulling or musing, that does not prove the idea is valid, as you know, but you keep that in mind. It's an obvious point. The mere fact that an idea occurs to you doesn't show it's valid. But the problem is psychologically keeping that in mind, because ideas usually come to you as if they were valid. Your subconscious usually feels that what it sends up is valid, is true. But objectivity means recognizing that what occurs to you in whatever state of mind is only material for conscious judgment and checking, not the voice of God within you. Self-monitoring includes noting and identifying conceptually your emotions, too. It is not just words that the subconscious feeds you, but feelings as well. And these are not to be ignored or repressed, but named, and if appropriate, analyzed. Now, you may be losing the structure here, but the, all this is leading up to a certain kind of uh, um, new understanding of the relationship of reason to emotion which integrates the distinction between focus and concentration and, and kind of uh, builds on everything I've said. This is the topic of emotionalism. And let me begin inductively with an example. A woman ends an affair with a man. The man is badly hurt but doesn't want to acknowledge the hurt. He feels that being hurt is weak and unmanly. But it's okay for a man to be angry. Anger is not weak. So he begins mulling about, irrationally mulling about, musing over, stewing over the breakup. As he goes over and over, every past moment of the affair, suddenly everything negative about her looms very large in his mind. None of her virtues get past the periphery of his awareness, only her flaws and lapses. He begins to take satisfaction in the overall image that is emerging. Yeah, I'm not being rejected. I'm just realizing now how no good she was all along. There is now a parallel pleasure-dominated example. 
which is called fascination. Colloquially, it's called having a crush on someone. Here, the lover focuses only on the good or imagined good qualities about the, his beloved. Love is not blind, but this kind of crush wears blinders. Now, this doesn't have to be irrational or emotionalism. If it's a teenager uh, just becoming familiar with this whole realm of uh, romance. But you can construct the example yourself of the 40-year-old man who improperly idolizes a woman against what his better judgment would tell him. I raise this case only to illustrate that emotionalism can occur under the influence of at least seemingly positive feelings as well as negative ones. Now, what is going on in these examples from the standpoint of free will as the choice to think, to focus, to self-regulate? Emotionalism is usually described as putting emotions above thoughts. But emotions are based upon ideas, either on rational thought or on irrational conceptual processing, on pseudo-thought. So putting ideas, uh, sorry, putting emotions above thought uh, is not the bottom line. It's true. It's a way of describing it on a certain level. Listen to this quote from Galt's speech. Those emotions you worship as an idol on whose altar you sacrifice the earth, that dark, incoherent passion within you, which you take as the voice of God or of your glands, is nothing more than the corpse of your mind. An emotion that clashes with your reason, an emotion that you cannot explain or control, is only the carcass of that stale thinking which you forbade your mind to revise. Close quote. Emotions don't come from some source within you different from the source of your cognitive conclusions. Emotions come from the same internal data bank, your subconscious. So what emotionalism reduces to is letting your subconscious run undirected, putting the automatic above the volitional. It's the wanton refusal to exercise control. And the control required is not control over the occurrence of the emotions themselves. The control required is control over the evaluative, integrative processes that produce them. Plus, of course, the control not to act on them. So what I'm saying is the traditional image of the emotionalist situation is not right. I mean the image of a man with a little angel on one shoulder and a little devil on the other, and each talks to him in turn. And, you know, you translate that as one is reason, the other is emotion. There are not two separate sources of advice which the man under temptation has to choose between. Both voices come from the same source, the subconscious. The choice is not between two different sources or two different people, but between one's considered judgment using all the information available to him versus, forgive me, a rush to judgment, a hasty, short-range, out-of-context appraisal. Leaving aside the possibility of going and getting additional information from the outside world, there's only one database a man has, his subconscious. His database is the same whether he goes by reason or goes by emotion. The difference is in the amount of objective querying of his database he does the quantity and range of information he brings to bear on the issue. The important conclusion is this. An emotionalist can feel like he is thinking, not emoting. The jilted lover can feel, I am actively integrating. I am really seeing things clearly now. 
when he is not, when he is feverishly integrating, but with tunnel vision, i.e. with artificial limits set by unexamined premises such as that a real man can't be hurt. He feels he is thinking with the emotions only accompanying the thought. But what he is actually doing is what I call emotionalizing. Emotionalizing. Emotionalizing is emotion-dominated thinking. Now, this is my term. I just made it up a month ago in preparing these lectures. <laughs> emotion-dominated thinking. But that even that's not the fundamental. It's tunnel vision thinking fueled by a neurotic need. Tunnel vision is not a passive thing. It's not just forgetting to check your premises. It's a compulsive state a state governed by a desperate need to reach some preordained conclusion. When a person allows himself to emotionalize instead of think, he is not in a static state. And this is what makes it a little tricky. A flood of ideas occurs to him, but he neither judges them objectively nor does he take control of the process by selecting the next question to ask himself. In emotionalizing, one uncritically accepts the material and the agenda provided by the subconscious. The jilted lover, for example, can feel as though he is judging because there are all sorts of questions occurring to him and answers being given, more of them than normal. So. His mind may be racing with data. In his growing anger, he is energized to make all sorts of connections. He feels he is integrating, but he is actually context dropping. Or worse than context dropping, his tunnel vision, which feeds him only the bad he can dredge up about the girl or invent about the girl, is more like context evading. The good things about the girl that occur to him or could occur to him don't count. They are no longer real. Or in the other case, the case of the man with the crush, the negatives don't count. What about that she speaks with the lisp? Oh, I mean, that doesn't matter. I mean, not that that's so negative, but you know <laughs> what I'm talking about. So he brushes aside the negatives as ins insignificant, something not to be admitted into consciousness to spoil the glamorized image of the woman that he is supporting. One step in proper reasoning, not emotionalizing, but the opposite, is deliberately, honestly looking for counter data. Free will includes the ability to separate oneself enough from any hypothesis that one has formed to check it by honestly seeking counter data. In other words, it looks very much like X, but can I actually, let me look for any non-Xs that might be out there. When one is in the grip of powerful feelings motivated by self-doubt, one does not feel free to do this. And I mean the word feel there, deliberately. There is a feeling that one cannot do this, that one cannot let go of the hypothesis long enough even to look to see is there any other counter evidence. It's a desperate need, a compulsive uh, need to hold on to that hypothesis as an absolute. So I think what goes on in emotionalizing is two things. The subconscious, because unsupervised, gets into a loop of only looking for confirmatory data rather than looking for all data. And secondly, there's a kind of reification, judging a person, to use that example which we've been taking, but it would apply more widely, but judging a person as if he consisted of nothing but the one aspect or one action that is in your mind now. In the tunnel vision of emotionalizing, one is unwilling to say 
Yes, this aspect or action is good or is bad, but what about the other aspects or actions? How do they interrelate? What is the fundamental? If the case you're judging is truly mixed and there are contradictory elements, such as in judging compartmentalized people, say a man is good in his work and bad in his private life, then you have to ask, how are mixed cases to be assessed? How much weight is to be assigned to this element and how much to that element in the mixture? In emotionalizing, these questions are not asked or not asked seriously or honestly. But basically, the mind compulsively grabs on one idea and one hypothesis, one fact, discards the rest of the person, the rest of the mix, the rest of the counter data out in reality, and just tenaciously holds on that. Now, of course, not every case is mixed. We confront a lot of mixed cases in reality, but not every case is mixed. I'm not saying that objectivity means searching for feet of clay in Ayn Rand or looking for redeeming qualities in Stalin. That is vicious nonsense, and it misses my point. My point is that emotionalizing means the refusal to accept the possibility of a mixed case, the refusal to hold the wider context. Put it this way. To make a judgment is like holding a trial in your own mind. And emotionalizing means holding a mock trial. Ayn Rand uses this metaphor in Galt's speech. The ego you seek is not your emotions or inarticulate dreams, but your intellect, that judge of your supreme tribunal, whom you've impeached in order to drift at the mercy of any stray shyster you describe as your feelings. Close quote. So you have to hold fair trials in your mind. But in emotionalizing, one makes it a precondition of admitting something into evidence that it confirms one's prejudice. The subconscious is activated by values, whether those values are rational and proper or irrational and improper. The, thing, the things one cares about are the fuel of the subconscious. So if one doesn't exert rational control over the operations of one's mind, what the subconscious will admit into awareness will be governed by the following modified form of Johnny Cochran's famous slogan. The emotionalist slogan is, if it doesn't fit, don't admit. In other words, feed me only that data, he says to his subconscious, that makes me feel good. Or if the person is a chronic emotionalizer, it's more likely, Feed me only that data that makes me feel less bad, less lacking in self-esteem. You see, there's a reciprocal link between emotional intensity and integration. The more intense the emotion, the more power the subconscious has to drag up data. Emotions and values turn up the voltage that activates subconscious connections. But high voltage is not the same thing as effort. Focus is not the same thing as concentration. Doing work is not the same thing as doing right work. And emotional inten intensity, racing mind, uh, all kinds of connections being made is not the same thing per se as putting forth the effort required to regulate your mind. And introspectively, Emotionalizing is experienced as downhill running. It feeds on itself. One feels swept along. No matter how much cognitive content is coming into one's consciousness, it's really like my example of concentration induced by hearing a gunshot or seeing a nude woman walk into the room. It's concentration that goes on in emotionalizing. But that's not necessarily the same as focus. If effort, if the effort to be objective, to monitor and regulate and ask the right questions, if that effort is not there, 
It's emotionalizing, but it's not focus. It's not reason. So the dis let me add this uh, uh, also a qualification. The distinction between an emotionalistic conclusion and a rational judgment doesn't concern whether the idea that you happen to end up with corresponds to reality or not. Maybe an emotionalizer would come to the same conclusion if he were being objective. Let's say the jilted lover, if he would honestly survey the facts, would conclude, you know, that woman was no good all along. That's not the point. The point is that the same conclusion, if reached by emotionalizing, is arbitrary and subjective. The issue isn't the uh, external correctness of the conclusion. The issue is what drives emotionalizing. Emotionalizing is driven by an emotional need, not by the facts, which means that one is not integrating even though one feels he is. The jolted lover is feeling, now I really see the big picture. Now I see why that phone call happened last month. And now I see why she wore that dress to that party when she knew I liked the other one. And now I, it all fits together, you see. I'm integrating. But in fact, the integration is going on on autopilot, which means it's governed by, in this case, his neurotic need to justify himself and to say, I wasn't rejected. I really rejected her and didn't know it. Now, it, the fact that it's going on this way, that it, I said it feels like thinking, but the fact that this is its nature means that you, he can know that this is the case. He can know he's being subjective if he chooses to exercise his free will to self-monitor, if he shakes off the, grips, the grip of his prejudices, asserts control by using his free will to take a fresh, honest, unbiased, objective look at the situation, he will no longer then feel that his previous state was one of integration. After the grip of an emotion has been broken, it's very clear to one that what one was previously doing was emotionalizing, not thinking or integrating. So this is an, on the other hand, I made a big point that, of the fact that on the one hand, emotionalizing can feel like cognition, even though it isn't. And now I'm saying on the other hand, there's a sense in which it doesn't feel like cognition. So it potentially can feel like non-cognition, but you have to do work to make the distinction. There is a feeling quality to emotionalizing that makes it easily distinguishable from rational cognition. But it's distinguishable, not automatically distinguished. The feeling quality is that emotionalizing feels ego involved. Rational cognition has a feeling of calm freedom, the freedom to survey all the facts. Another factor is the operation of unfaced material. Stuff whispered in the background or even buried in the subconscious can be tremendously powerful in governing what the subconscious sends up. Uh, take this another example now, and then we're going to return to the calm feeling of freedom. Suppose you're facing a difficult intellectual task, such as writing an essay in philosophy. The background thought is, it's too hard. And the it is a big, black, unconcretized, unanalyzed whole task, rather than the next small step. And the same thing works on the positive, is when you have a task in front of you and you don't face consciously how big, difficult, time consuming that task really is. And you say, oh, I can knock that off in two minutes. These are not uh, necessarily emotionalizing, but they're on the same premise of the subconscious is really determining the agenda rather than the conscious mind. And there's a motivation in a psychoepistemology to letting the subconscious take over.
The psychopistemology consists in not making something fully conscious, whether it's semi-conscious, latent, or repressed. And it takes effort to make things fully conscious. Not pain necessarily, but effort. The motivation side is that one feels as though facing it would be a bad idea. Now, that, it's interesting how that applies in my first example. It's too hard. I can't do it. Now, the solution is to face it and to say, well, what is the it and why can't you do it? And if you face it, you, you understand, oh, the it is writing this specific paragraph on this little point. Well, I can do that. And your emotions change. But until you face it, it seems like facing it would be a bad thing to do. In other words, when you, when you don't face something, you assume it's infinitely bad. That's, that's what you're telling your subconscious. It can be just, uh, you know, uh, the need to brush your teeth bef before you go to sleep. But if you feel, no, I can't, I can't think about that, then you're saying, this thing is so bad that it's of higher badness than the value of my being conscious. I would rather silence my mind than look at this. Now, the joke is that uh, unless you're a very bad person, 99.99 .99 times out of 100, once you look at it, you say, oh, this isn't so bad, is it? In other words, your emotions are not good predictors even of your own future emotions. And that's a very important principle to realize. It took me a long time to realize that. It's like the mother who says, Johnny, try some spinach. And he says, no, I don't like spinach. And she says, how do you know you haven't tried it? And he says, I don't want to try it, because if I try it, I might like it, and I don't like spinach. <laughs> so emotion, emotions are not only not good predictors of stock prices and things like that. <laughs> emotions are not good predictors of how you will feel if you start to face something or act on something or refuse something, you, well, okay. The same thing goes on the positive uh, side, if you can call it the positive, oh, I can knock that off in two minutes, and you feel, if I don't face how much time this takes, I can do it and I'll enjoy it. But because you're not facing how much time it takes, you do it and you start to enjoy it, and then you notice that the time's getting late and you have to you know, either evade your appointment that you're missing and, or Drop this in the middle when you're just getting excited. So it isn't good when you're actually over rushed because you didn't face the full time required. In emotionalizing, the processing is governed by a false absolute motivationally. Now, the only real absolutes are reason and life, i.e., finding out what reality demands so that one can live, remain in reality. But the emotionalizer has got some out of context absolute going. Usually, I've got to ward off this threat. Then his subconscious feeds him supporting data or pseudo data on the premise of fitting in with that absolute. Everything has to fit that absolute. He takes it as the given. So logically enough, everything has to fit in with it. So in emotionalizing, the motivation behind the processing is to defend some false absolute. In rational cognition, the motivation is the absolute of knowing the full objective truth. And that's free will. The effortful choice to run your mind by the truth motive or not to. Or in the terms I opened this first lecture with on Monday, the commitment to full awareness of reality or anything less than that. So now um, I'm putting the whole picture together, the picture from the beginning of the lecture to now. We can solidify everything by using one of two metaphors that I'm going to give you. And it will, it will show you the, the immediately preceding material, I think, as well as everything right back to the beginning. I mean, it will, it will concretize it for you or, or package it for you. 
the first metaphor is this. You, your free will is the choice you have to make reality king in your consciousness. When you don't do that, your conclusions are subjective. Reality has to be king in the sense of entering your mind by right and not by permission. But you have to give it that right by your free choice. Determinists always want to ask, what made Joe focus and Bill not? Look at what this means. What factor pushed Joe into being objective and prevented Bill from being objective? That's a contradiction in terms. What could push you into being objective? The only thing that could do that would be for the full context to fasten itself on your mind and make the mind be objective. The full context can't do that. Because what is the full context? It's everything you know. So the determinists are asking, in effect, what automatically activated all of Joe's knowledge for him? What made Joe integrate all the facts, disregarding the pushes and pulls of his emotions, while Bill did go with the pushes and pulls of his emotions? Well, what could the answer be? It couldn't be the truth with a capital T that sees Joe's mind. The facts of reality, most of which are not in front of him stimulating his senses, can't thrust themselves upon him. <clears throat> Concepts are open-ended and they apply to things millions of years in the past and millions of years in the future, not just what's right in front of your nose. So dinosaurs are not present to enter as part of the full context when he thinks about what's for dinner or the nature of life or whatever, but they might be relevant in some way. The facts of reality can't be something that seizes a mind and puts it into focus, nor could it be some internal psychological factor that makes Joe focus. Why not? Because what we are talking about is whether Joe puts reality ahead of psychological factors or not. The choice to perceive reality, all the relevant facts, not just the one that one psychology permits, is exactly what I've been talking about. It's exactly what free will consists of. Put it this way. The relationship one establishes between facts and feelings, or between tunnel vision context and full context, that relationship can't be determined by either facts or feelings, or either the narrow context or the wide context. The issue of which is to be the ruling absolute, facts or feelings, is chosen first. Reality can't make itself king in your consciousness, nor can feelings make you put, real, uh, uh, put them ahead of reality, or put reality ahead of them, either way. So it's like a jurisdictional dispute here, you see, and there needs to be a Supreme Court. So reality can't place itself first, and feelings can't place reality first. That's a contradiction. Imagine someone said, uh, my feelings made me be objective. Or Fred was independent in order to impress his mother. <laughs> it's a contradiction. Feelings can't put you in touch with reality. To be capable of objectivity, reality must enter your mind by right, not by permission of your feelings. That's just what we've been talking about. That's what the unconditional acceptance of reality means, that the acceptance of reality is not conditional upon it makes me look like a real man, or it allows me to have that extra piece of pie, or any emotional consideration. So it can't be determined by your psychology. Or to put it in terms deeper than feelings, a partial context selected by a prejudice cannot be the cause of taking an unprejudiced survey of the whole context. That's the same point made in terms of the psychoepistemological mechanics of emotionalizing. So that's the metaphor of making reality king in your consciousness. 
The second metaphor is also a political one, but it's from the opposite perspective. To be objective, you have to look upon the whole of reality as your property. It's the same point, really, as making reality king, because it means your mind has to consider reality as your domain, as material for your use cognitively. But the point of adding this metaphor, that reality is your property, is to make the contrast with tunnel vision and to bring in this idea of the calm feeling of freedom to survey all the facts rather than this, you know, tunnel vision. I've got to, I've got, to, I can't, I can't look beyond here. I've just got to see this, this, this. And I think the idea of reality is your property uh, captures the attitude that Ayn Rand herself had. The attitude that no fact of reality could conceivably be a threat to her, that reality was her ally. And whatever she found there could only strengthen her resources, never threaten them. In Philosophic Detection, she says, quote, if you keep an active mind, you will discover, assuming that you started with common sense rationality, that every challenge you examine will strengthen your convictions, that the conscious reasoned rejection of false theories will help you to clarify and amplify the true ones, that your ideological enemies will make you invulnerable by providing countless demonstrations of their own impotence. A little later, if you are the kind of person who knows that reality is not your enemy, that truth and knowledge are of crucial, personal, selfish importance to you and to your own life, then the more passionately personal the thinking, the clearer and truer. What do, close quote. What distinguishes that from emotionalizing? The looking at the whole context, the consideration of opposite views, the asking oneself, have I left out something? Is there any counter data? Am I ego involved here? Or am I looking at the facts objectively? Am I letting my feelings decide what I'm going to consider? And the more you're committed to reality is my domain. Everything out there is potentially good for me, and I want to see it. And nothing can really destroy me out there. There can be irritations and annoyances, but I can deal with them. That attitude is the opposite of and prevents emotionalizing. Now, this leads us to a more abstract theoretical point. And I'm now kind of segueing into less psychological, uh, more officially philosophical or integrative material. It leads us to the point that determinism is self-refuting. Determinism is self-refuting because it wipes out the concept of objectivity. This is a little different perspective on the self-refuting nature of determinism than you've probably ever heard before, but I think it's just a deeper way of saying what you probably have heard before. Determinism wipes out the concept of objectivity, and thus the claim that determinism is objectively true is a self-contradiction. Look at the facts that give rise to the concept objectivity. The facts that give rise to the concept objective or objectivity include such things as the difference between mistake and correct conclusion, between the fallible and the infallible, between the subjective and that which is reality-governed object. So to call a deterministic process objective, I'm going to argue, is to steal the concept. The concept objective does not apply to sense perception. It would be a stolen concept to say, I see you now objectively. Why not? Why is that? Why can't I say that? Because there's no such thing as seeing you subjectively. Okay. I can't say I'm seeing the words in front of me correctly. Why not? 
Because there's no such thing as seeing them incorrectly. Sense perception is not objective because it can't be subjective. It's just sense perception. It's just the given. It's just contact with reality. And sense perception is the given and is unquestionable precisely because it's subject to physical determinism. Conceptual objectivity, conceptual objectivity is caused by the ego, by the conscious self, not by physical deterministic factors. And that's why it's different. And that's why subjectivity is an option, bad option. We're not like on the a Jerry Springer show where they say, it's a choice. Yeah, it's a choice, the wrong choice to be subjective, but it's a choice. Let me quote to you from Galt's speech on the issue of the, the focus here is senses are the given because they're physically determined, but the mind has to be judged because it isn't. Quote, the day when he grasps uh, that his senses cannot deceive him, that, his phys that physical objects cannot act without causes, that his organs of perception are physical and have no volition, no power to invent or to distort, that they, uh, the evidence they give him is an absolute, but his mind must learn to understand it. His mind must discover the nature, the causes, the full context of his sensory material. His mind must identify the things that he perceives. That is the day of his birth as a thinker and scientist. The mere fact that an the close quote, the mere fact that an idea occurs to a person is no validation of it. The mere fact that he believes it strongly, that he feels he couldn't live without this belief, is no validation of it. To grasp that a belief can be wrong, that feelings do not validate an idea, is a precondition of grasping objectivity. And it implies that objectivity is volitional. A determined mind could not make such distinctions among what it was fed. A determined mind could not distinguish its feelings from cognition. Both feelings and cognition would be automatic, unquestionable givens like the data of sense. If your mind were determined, then everything it was fed, ideas, feelings, everything, would have the same status. Any idea that occurred to you would be the unquestionable given just like the data of sense perception. Not only would seeing be believing, but believing would be knowing. Or more precisely, there'd be no distinction between belief and knowledge. There'd be no concept of proof or logic, no concept of objectivity versus subjectivity. Every content of its consciousness, this determined mind, would be the unchallengeable given. Thus, the concept objectivity cannot be applied to a determined mind. It is not that sometimes a determined mind can be objective when conditions are right, and sometimes it is subjective when conditions are wrong. If a determined mind is fallible, it cannot said to ever be right. It is like a stopped clock. A stopped clock is not right twice a day. It is never right. Let's return to our standard friend, the parrot. Suppose a parrot is trained to squawk, it's raining. Now sometimes when it squawks that, it may indeed be raining. But the parrot is not right even in those instances. A human observer of the parrot could, by interpreting the parrot squawks as human language, say what the parrot squawked is true. But that's only on the basis of what he perceives and judges by his volitional mind. True and false or correct, mistaken, objective, subjective, proved, unproved are concepts that do not apply to parrot squawks in themselves. In the same way, the output of a deterministic human mind would not be sometimes right and sometimes wrong. None of those concepts apply to it, right or wrong. 
It could not ever be objective, even if the output it squawked could be judged valid by an outside observer using his free will to interpret the squawks in his context, volitional context. Look at an ethical political analogy. I'm getting excited about this because for years I thought the, the argument reduced to, well, the determined mind can, not, can never know which times it's being right and which times it's determined to be wrong. But there's a much, this is a much deeper answer to it. The concept of right and wrong, true and false, never apply. Doesn't matter whether its output corresponds to the facts or not. Look at an ethical political analogy. You know the point that forcing someone, quote, for his own good is a contradiction in terms. Even if you know that some course of action would benefit another person if he chose to take it, to point a gun at his head and order him to do it destroys any value that he could get out of it. It negates his mind, and that's the root of his value. Values are objective, not intrinsic. To be of value to someone, the thing has to be valued by him. His perception of its nature, not your gun, has to be the cause of his pursuing it. And here's the analogy. If a deterministic factor were able to compel you to perform certain mental operations, the same mental operations that we actually perform by free will, those operations as forced on you by that factor would not be valid, would not be rational, logical, or objective. Just as the physical action of your body under physical force is not the pursuit of a value. When the determinist asks, yes, but what made you think, he ignores that if the process were, as he assumes, forced on you by something, it would not be thinking. The same goes for focus. Right from the beginning in Monday's lecture, you've heard me say, focus is not some particular state existing as an isolated, out-of-context condition. So, for instance, you can't say level X of concentration means you're in focus. Or asking questions every half second means you're in focus. Or not asking questions means you're in focus. Or micromanaging means you're in focus. Or macromanaging means you're in focus. It's not some specific uh, mental operation or physical condition or brain state so you can't describe it regardless of what caused it. Focus is mental purposefulness. It is mental self-regulation. A state into which something throws you is neither purposefulness nor self-regulation. Being attentive is something that can be compelled, at least momentarily, as in the case of hearing a gunshot. But being objective by its very nature is not something that can be compelled. Being objective because something forced it on you is a contradiction in terms. Whether you're talking about physical force or psychological force, compulsion, fear, doesn't matter. Objectivity is adherence to reality by choice in the face of the possibility of departing from reality which one has control over by direct will. Objectivity means choosing to use the method of logic to control and check one's ideas, rather than just accepting whatever pops into one's mind. But according to determinism, everything is something that just pops into your head. Now this is not a disproof of determinism or a proof of free will. To imagine otherwise is anti-hierarchical. Such a thing as a theory's needing proof or disproof already presupposes free will. Without free will, all ideas would have the same status as in sense perception. They would just be the given. And just as what you see with your eyes is subject to neither proof nor disproof, so it would be for the beliefs of a deterministic consciousness. So. Once we're saying, how do you prove free will? How do you answer this argument? You're already accepted. You've already accepted free will. A, a computer can't function that way, even if it were conscious. So free will is not a theory, but a self-evident fact. All that you need to say to validate the idea of free will is, 
Look, look at the phenomenon of choice. Look at the difference between the effortful and the non-effortful actions of consciousness. And that's why we spent so much time looking in the first lecture. Free will is not only self-evident, but fundamental to all conceptual knowledge. In other words, it is an axiom. One can show that something is an axiom by the procedure known as reaffirmation through denial. And that's what the self-refuting nature of determinism represents. It shows that every proposition, even when denying the existence of free will, has to secretly acknowledge free will. But reaffirmation through denial is not a proof of truth. It is a proof of fundamentality. And that applies to any use of reaffirmation through denial. It is not a proof of truth. It is a proof of fundamentality. It says you can't get away from this because it's fundamental. It's contained in all knowledge. The demonstration that denying free will makes objectivity impossible and that determinism is self-refuting only shows that free will, which you already know to exist, is not some derivative or narrow fact, but a fact at the base of man's knowledge. It proves it's fundamental. Now we come to the point that was listed first in the Lyceum catalog description, the metaphysics of free will. I move this to last because it's mainly a polemical point. The question is the reconciliation of free will with the law of causality. Here's one formulation of the alleged problem. Every event has a cause that makes it happen, so what about focusing? If it has a cause, then we are denying free will. If it doesn't have a cause, then we are denying science and landing in indeter indeterminism. That's, that's a bad writer. Landing in indeterminism. There's lots of ins there. Okay, that version can quickly be disposed of. The law of causality does not relate events to preceding events. It relates actions to the entities that act. So if you ask, does the action of focusing have a cause? The answer is yes, definitely. The cause is the man who focuses. He is the entity, he acts. End of story. But the more sophisticated version of the alleged problem goes this way, and this is where I'm going to devote most of my remaining time to. Causality implies the same entity in the same circumstances will act the same way. But you claim that the same man in the same circumstances could focus or not, that there are two possibilities open. He can regulate or not. It doesn't matter what terms you put, put it forward. And he can put forth the effort or not. He can self-monitor. But the same thing can only do the same thing in the same circumstances. The answer to this is that there is no such thing as focus existing apart from choice. The, ph the phenomenon we observe is not focus versus non-focus. The phenomenon we observe introspectively now is choosing focus versus choosing non-focus. Those are hyphenated. Choosing hyphen focus versus choosing hyphen non-hyphen focus. The questioner will then say, John Gauld and James Taggart do not act the same in the same circumstances. One focuses and the other evades. But this is reifying an abstraction. What observably goes on is Gauld chooses one way and Taggart the other. And choice is choice. It is not a reaction. Keep that in mind. We'll return to it in a second. So the integration of causality and volition is that only one action is in fact possible in the circumstances. The action of choosing between focus and non-focus. By his nature, man must choose. Now I used to ask, what is the content of man must choose? Isn't it simply a way of disguising the issue, a way of saying that man's nature is not to have a nature in this respect? But if you look at the facts, man must choose does have a definite content. And it doesn't mean man's, it does not mean man's nature is indefinite in any respect. Now here's the point. 
To say man must choose is not simply to say that there's this theoretical alternative of A and non-A. Focus and non-focus, A and non-A. So I'm going to put them together in a package called the package choice and blur over the fact that all I'm saying is it's, there's an A and a non-A. No. To say man must choose means something definite. And we, there are A's and non-A's between which man doesn't have to choose. Shocking, isn't it? There are A's and non-A's between which man does not have to choose. That's a contrast to the A and non-A of focus between which man does have to choose. Here's my contrasting example. While coming to this lecture, you didn't have to choose between whistling Yankee Doodle or not. That is not a necessitated choice, even though it's A and non-A, Whistling it? Not whistling it. Now, presumably, none of you did A. <laughs> you didn't choose to whistle Yankee Doodle. Nor did, you, uh, nor did you choose not to whistle it. But you did choose, and you had to choose between being in focus and not. The difference is this. It never occurred to you to whistle Yankee Doodle. It was not an issue you confronted. Well, I assume you can whistle Yankee Doodle. Maybe you don't know how to whistle or you don't know that song. But for those of you who can, I'm now going to make it an issue. Right now, are you going to whistle Yankee Doodle or not? Okay. If you are listening, you can't avoid choosing. So before you came in, you could avoid choosing on that issue. But right then, you could not avoid choosing on that issue. Focus is very different. Beyond the age of about two, you can't help confronting it. You can't help knowing that you face a constant alternative of putting forth the effort to use your mind or not. That is relevant every waking moment, and the consequences of which choice you make are at least peripherally present to you, if only as a sense or feel. Maybe one could maintain that there are brief periods when you're not aware even peripherally of the issue. I don't absolutely preclude that. But if so, if, then in those rare moments, you are not morally responsible for choosing to focus your mind, and you are not compelled to choose. But even if so, that is a rare exception. It doesn't affect anything. And as a normal, virtually permanent condition, you must choose. You confront it. You're aware of it. Now let's bring back my point that choice is a choice and not a reaction. I'm going to have to take up some of the question period because I, for some reason this is a longer lecture and the, the, it just gets juicier the further we go into it. So you won't feel strained here. Let's bring back my point that choice is choice, not a reaction. I raised the issue of free will and causality with Ayn Rand 20 years ago. And the following are my notes on what she said. I can't vouch for the exact wording, but it sounds like her. Quoting from my notes, the appearance of a conflict between causality and free will is due to taking causality to be only that which governs the material world. Consciousness is an existent having a nature different from that of matter. The law of causality implies, accordingly, that the type of action consciousness can take will be different. Close quote. If it is a quote, I'm not really sure, but it, it's at least a quote from my notes on what she said. The crucial point is this. Free will means choice, and choice is an action of consciousness. Consciousness is not matter. Consciousness is not governed by billiard ball-like reactions. Consciousness has a nature different from that. Consciousness on the conceptual level is self-initiated. The nature of conceptual consciousness is to be volitional, not deterministic. That is to be able to turn itself on, to set awareness as its goal, which then activates it. So the final perspective to solidify all this is that free will 
does not have to reconcile itself with causality. Causality has to reconcile itself with free will. The law of causality is an induction from observation of concretes. Any induction on any subject must embrace all the facts observed. For instance, if you observe that there are black cats, white cats, gray cats, orange cats, etc., you could not induce all cats are black. That would be an improper induction. Suppose you nonetheless perversely hold on to all cats are black, and you give it a name, the law of catness. The law of catness says all cats are black. Now, how do I reconcile that with orange cats? I've got the law of catness and orange cats. Then two schools arise. One says orange cats only appear to be orange, they're really black. <laughs> and the others say they're orange, all right, only they aren't really cats. <laughs> but both schools are wrong. The law of catness is not a given to which the data must adjust. It is an induction, proper or as in this case improper from the data. The so-called law of catness is way too narrow. The proper law of catness is that a cat must have some but any of the following list of colors. A cat can't be green, it can't be transparent like glass, but it can be any of the range of colors we actually observe cats to have. So the dilemma of the orange cat arises only if one has too narrow an induction, too limited a version of the law of catness. And our formulation of the law of catness must adjust to the reality not the other way around. I think you see where I'm going. It's the same for the law of causality. It's an induction. It must embrace all the facts or else it's not formed properly. What facts? Well, facts about the nature of entities and what these entities do. Like a basketball bounces, a feather doesn't. But do we have observations only about material objects? No. We also have observations about people from introspection of our own consciousness and observation of others. And our induction of causality must embrace the facts of human action as well. What facts? Well, first level, what a person does depends not upon the wind, the rain, the fire, but on what's going on inside him, what he thinks and decides. Second level observation, thinking and deciding are actions of my consciousness. Are these actions of consciousness the same as or different from the actions of physical objects? Different. How? In many ways, including that matter is passive. Consciousness is active. In fact, consciousness as a state is activity. Remember the quote from the epistemology book. Consciousness as a state of awareness is not a passive state, but an active process. More induction. What categories of action is consciousness capable of? Well, such actions as perception, thought, emotion. What is the nature of these actions? Some are automatic, some are volitional. For example, percepts are automatic, emotions are automatic, thought isn't, it's chosen. This is the introspective observation of free will, the difference between the automatic and the volitional processes of your consciousness. So your formulation of the law of causality must embrace the observed differences between the automatic and volitional actions of consciousness, and then consciousness is different from matter. So fix in your mind the opposition of matter and free will. Don't think of it as causality and free will. How do I recognize it? It's matter and free will are two different things. And I remind you of this sentence from Galt's speech. The day when he grasps that matter has no volition is the day when he grasps that he has. To restrict causality to the case of matter is as arbitrary as it would be to restrict it to the case of consciousness. The mystics of muscles say, matter and material interactions, as in billiard balls colliding, that's the only data we need to consider in inducing causality. The mystics of spirit say, causality, that's spiritual interactions, as in God choosing to create the universe and give it order. 
For the mystics of spirit, matter does what it does because some consciousness wills it to. In fact, their version of the law of causality rules out physical determinism, just as the mystics of muscles version rules out volition. Mystics of spirit formulate the law of causality as every action is in accordance with the will of the spirit or spirits that rule existence. This in human history has been by far the majority view. So don't get locked into narrow 20th century uh, United States view. Most of the views of the law of causality has been actions are in accordance with the will of the spirit or spirits that rule existence. Only God's will or some will or other can impose lawfulness on the chaos. This is the meaning of the argument from design for God. In formulating law, law of causality, the mystics of muscle want to consider only matter. The mystics of spirit want to consider only consciousness. But matter exists and consciousness exists. If we are to be true to the facts, we must consider both matter and consciousness. And if we do, we observe that matter is passive and that man's consciousness, at least, acts volitionally. So the induction of causality must embrace free will. So there can be no conflict between the law of causality and one of its inductive bases, the observed fact of free will. To assume otherwise is the fallacy of the frozen abstraction. Freezing the concept of causality at the level of physical causality and then making a puzzle out of the existence of free will. So let us admit that we have free will. Choose to acknowledge choice, the choice to make reality king in our consciousness rather than being compelled to assent to things fed us by something we cannot judge. You think I'm winding up, but I'm not. I got uh, three more minutes of great stuff. Now let us ask, what is the name in philosophy for the attitude that we have to accept whatever idea something we cannot judge feeds us? Mysticism. Mysticism is the claim to an automatic form of conceptual knowledge, whereby hunches, intuitions, and any other form of automatic produced stuff is taken as knowledge. Determinism Determinism is often thought of as scientific, but in fact, determinism and mysticism go hand in hand. Mysticism is a deterministic view of mental operations. And determinism entails mysticism, taking uncontrolled, unvalidated voices in the head as knowledge. Determinism maintains just what the mystic claims, that knowledge is fed to him, and he is the passive recipient of voices that speak through him. If determinism were true, that would be correct. And if mysticism were correct, determinism would be true. Except that if either were correct, there'd be no such thing as correctness. <laughs> no such thing as truth. Every idea would be as true or false as any other. So ironically, if you look at that perspective, you know, every idea is true. Everything is just output, you know, that I'm fed. Determinism not only implies mysticism, it implies skepticism. Now, mysticism and skepticism have always been blood brothers. Mysticism says we have to go by these voices. And skepticism adds everybody's inner voices are as good or bad as anybody else's. That's why today's professional skeptics are more antagonistic to objectivism than they are to outright mystics. The objectivist has the arrogance to say he can condemn the mystic's revelation as nonsense and establish his own conclusions as objectively true. The skeptics merely smile at the mystic's claim to revelation, holding that their own, the mystic's only error is not recognizing that all truth is subjective. This is why the moderns always attack objectivism as a cult and a dogma with a vehemence and a negativity they don't use against actual cults and actual dogmas. You don't notice them crusading against Presbyterians who claim certainty. It's not just that they view any claim to certainty as dogmatic, it's worse than that. It's that anything goes except reason. 
Why? The basic answer is not moral, but metaphysical and epistemological. They oppose the idea that man is a being of volitional consciousness. This means they oppose the idea of method, of judgment, of objectivity. All ideas are forced upon us. That's their absolute. Given it, they can tolerate disputes between whether ideas are forced upon us by a supernatural realm or by our race, class, and gender or by our personal neuroses. But they have to hold on to ideas are like percepts. They are forced upon us. We can't be asked to process them. We can't be asked to will to connect to reality. It's just stuff in the head. So I'll close with Galt's summary statement, which I hope now has new meaning for you. This really is the close. Quote, accept the irrevocable fact that your life depends upon your mind. In fact, admit that the whole of your struggle, your doubts, your fakes, your evasions was a desperate quest for escape from the responsibility of a volitional consciousness, a quest for automatic knowledge, for instinctive action, for intuitive certainty. And while you called it longing for the state of an angel, what you were seeking was the state of an animal. Accept as your moral ideal the task of becoming a man. Close quote, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I see 13 minutes for a question period. I'm, I'm sorry that it ran so far over. Yeah. Testing. Hello? Okay. Yeah, the uh, microphone's working if you lean right okay, into it. Okay, great. Um, how do you inc integrate your points here about um, keeping the full range of data that you have available to you in focus? Um, when making a choice to, with um, Leonard Peikoff's um, lecture, first lecture in the art of thinking about actually maybe making the choice to shut certain things out. Um, now, I ha it's been a while since I've listened to that lecture, but I'm yeah, just wondering too. which may come first. What's the, if there's well, a link. Uh, Okay, I can't speak for him, uh, but, and I haven't heard that lecture in several years myself, but my understanding would be that that comes under the heading of what I talked about in e there is material that it is rational to eject. This is material that you yourself have in uh, calm, reasoned reflection previously decided is wrong ideas. So for instance, you're making a choice of um, whether to marry, ask, ask a girl to marry you. And you've just become an objectivist recently, and you know you have a whole religious context behind it, and you know that that marriage is a, a, a state sanctified by God is working in your mind, and divorce is immoral. And you say no to that whole context. You get it? No, no, no. Let me return to reality. Uh, that is, um, in other words, the full context does not include religion as if it were true. And his examples were more the analytical pragmatist um, rather than religious context that he had been taught in graduate school. So it presupposes to be rational that you have decided that a lot of material in your subconscious and the, and the methods of working with that material are wrong, are untrue, are not part of reality. So to make reality king means that you try not to be influenced by that you put it aside, you remind yourself this is false when you come to make a decision. And, uh, uh, okay, well, let's go on. Christina. Okay, I don't see a big conflict between the theory of the billiard ball and free will. I don't see it as two different things. And maybe there is a mistake in my reasoning, but the way I would see, I would say is that uh, the physical brain, I see it as a cause. And the effect, and consciousness 
you know, whatever things, physical things going on in the physical brain, I see as a cause of consciousness. Consciousness with all these attri attributes, including the fact that we must choose and the choice is free. Is that a wrong statement? Yeah, that's wrong. Uh, <laughs> I could everyone hear that she does see a, a, a contradiction between billiard ball uh, type interactions and free will because consciousness is caused by the brain and the brain is physical. Uh, and just one of the things that's caused is choice. That'll lead you to the dilemma that I was in years ago, which is how can a deterministic physical system produce a non-deterministic state called choice? And there's no way out of that. No, I'm not saying it causes the choice. It causes just the consciousness with all its attributes. Well, and then one oh, of the yes, attributes of consciousness oh, that's is that you I must see. choose, but the choice is that's free. True. That's true. That, and that's not only true, but it's a helpful addition to what I'm saying. So uh, I began by saying you're wrong. Now I say thank you. <laughs> um, it's, it is, it is, there is an, <laughs> another integration of uh, matter with consciousness, even though we have to distinguish them. Even though my theme is volition is an attribute of consciousness, let us remember that the physical brain is the cause of the phenomenon, the faculty of consciousness. Now, I see what you mean now. You can't be conscious if you don't have a brain. That's a, and that is, uh, um, you know, the primacy of existence, that matter comes before consciousness, and in this case enables consciousness. So uh, we don't want to say that consciousness floats free in the, you know, without a physical base. But uh, what I thought you were saying, but you weren't, was if you say the operation of consciousness in every moment and every specific you know thought and choice and so forth is just the inner side of some brain process then you would be in the contradiction of determinism but you weren't saying that so the faculty of consciousness is deterministically caused as far as we know by the healthy state of the brain which is a physical organ so for there to be consciousness, which then has choice over its own operations, there must be a healthy physical brain. Uh, that is very true and very helpful. Thank you. Yes, on this side? Um, I'll catch you. Okay. Um, when you talked about inducing um, causality, I wonder if you're talking about inducing the nature of causality or that there is causality. Because it seems to me having a law of identity and having a concept of action um, gives you that there will be causality, but the nature of it is undetermined. In other words, it was no, the, no, no, no. Uh, I don't see any difference between, suppose I said there and anything else. Suppose I said, well, you, surely you must, uh, in forming the concept of dog, first get to a stage where you, where you know that there are dogs, but you don't know their nature. It's impossible. Well, you you, know you use their nature to, to, to know that there's a dog in front of you. In other words, you don't, you don't even see a dog unless you see the difference between the dog and the floor it's standing on. The same way, you don't even have the concept of causality unless you have the idea of different things act different ways. There's no, there's no it is, but it is something distinction. I was thinking Existence in, is identity. No, I was yeah. thinking in terms of the essence, um, with the, it would be the analogy to the dog example, but I guess I'm wrong on that. In other words, you would form the concept Very wrong. Of it sounds yeah. like you're coming from an analytic synthetic dichotomy perspective. Have you had philosophy courses? Uh, yes. And I okay. Can we talk about, can I ask you about yeah. this later? Sir? Yeah, let's talk about it privately. Okay. Uh, I'm not trying to evade, you know, your question. I'm trying to answer it, but I think I could um, do that more profitably privately. There's no distinction between grasping causality and the nature of causality. Uh, yes? Uh, when I introspect and observe myself continuously making choices, such as where am I going to go, what am I going to do, mm -hmm. all of that sort of thing, aren't those choices determined, actually determined, by the chain of events that I set into action when I made the primary choice to focus or not? Excellent question. The answer is no, that, uh, that is a completely misinterpreted perspective. But I'm glad that a, a lot of, you know, 
good questions are coming up here that allow me to say something, <laughs> or that allow me to prevent misunderstandings that I went through for decades. So, Dr. Peikoff in OPAR distinguishes between the primary choice and higher level choices, and there's two errors you can make. No, before the error. Primary choice is to focus. Higher level choices, such thing as to focus on this or to focus on that. To, to keep focusing on this or to drop it and go to something else. To uh, get a drink of water or to continue on this subject. To vote for Bush or to vote for Gore, if that's the choice. Those are higher level choices, meaning, higher level meaning they're not at the fundamental. Now, the two errors you can make in regard to this, the relationship of the primary choice to the higher level choice is like intrinsic and subjective. One view is only the primary choice of focus is real. The rest automatically follow from that without any further choice. That is wrong. And, and that is the uh, premise of the question. That was what you were uh, suggesting. It is not true that the only volitional act you have to perform is turning on your mind, and if you do that and keep it running, then everything else just you know, follows. That is, that is introspectively false and does not make uh, sense when you push it, and that's sort of like intrinsicism. The other wrong view is, oh, so there are all these equal choices. First, I have to choose to think, and then as a just totally unrelated thing, I have to choose what to say, and as a totally unrelated thing, I'm going to choose what I'm going to have at lunch. No. It depends on the primary choice, but it isn't fully determined by the primary choice. You, ch you choose to focus, and then you have to choose to focus on what, and choose how to act. But those choices, including the choice to act, are not new primaries. They have preconditions. They, they arise because you are in focus. They would not arise if you were not in focus. But there is a volitional element to each of those choices, too. It is not, it is not something like, as long as I keep the, the beam of illumination turned up to a certain degree, I can predict all, all the words that will come out of my mouth and so forth. It is still a further volitional element. That's all I can say briefly on that, Mandy. Um, how would you distinguish a process of emotionalizing and a process of rationalizing? Uh, I, I wanted to cover that, actually. How do I distinguish emotionalizing and rationalizing? They feel very different, introspectively. <coughs> emotionalizing is a swept-away feeling. And these two do not exhaust the possibilities of irrationality, right? I just... I just realize that the, that the fact that focus wasn't concentration also, and that you could confuse the two, also tied in with um, high energy, f rapid fire conclusion making, which could feel like thinking, isn't necessarily thinking. It can be something that's pseudo thinking, and that's emotionalizing. Now in emotionalizing, you know, your mind is revved up, you're active, things seem very convincing to you, very persuasive to you, but there's this desperate sense. There's this sense of, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if it's angry, um, I can't do it with my face because it's an inner, it's an inner issue of whether you have blinders on and are, and are letting your emotion set the agenda or not. And I can't act that. Maybe a good actor can. Rationalizing is where one wispy, uh, phony feeling reason comes up to support something. Like you want to break your diet, and there's that piece of pine, you want it, and it occurs to you, it's the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> now that is a very different state from and when people tell you their rationalizations, they smile, they say, it's the weekend. And if <laughs> the smile is the fishiness of it, you know, acknowledged. The emotionalizer is powerfully convinced by a torrent of thoughts that are, uh, would be thoughts if they were in full context and weren't driven by this emotion. The rationalizer gets this. Well, you know, it's not, you know, who knows? Why should I struggle? Nobody can know. Who can tell? 
this thin, wispy, phony, phony to him, unpersuasive feeling. It's like a hook he can hang something on, not a flood of ideas that are coming in. So would you say that the rationalization is you're trying to delude yourself that you're being logical, whereas when yeah. you emotionalize, there's not that focus on trying to be... Uh, I, I'll have to think about that. The, the rationalizer is trying to um, avoid the feeling he's being, he's being wrong. He's trying to answer guilt on a semi-conscious level. The emotionalizer may be tr ultimately trying to get rid of guilt or pain or fear, but it doesn't feel that way. It feels like cognition. And it, and it is cognition, you know, usually the emotionalizer is seeing real facts, only they're too narrow. You know what I mean? Like if you think back about the O.J. Simpson uh, trial, yes, I'm sure O.J. was a wonderful uh, father and loving husband at times. And yes, he probably did, you know, the things that were given as his character reference, he probably does love his mother. And, you know, and he and he's probably did uh, tell Nicole, uh, I'm glad it's finally over. It's just what Peter Schwartz, um, uh, there, it's what Peter Schwartz covered in his objectivity lecture. Uh, you can uh, in journalism, you can slant the facts by not putting forward the full context and letting, uh, shoehorning in, as he said, facts to fit a preordained conclusion. And, it, uh, and that's really your question. In rationalization, the shoehorning in is, is pathetic even to you and is, is more consciously available to you. In, the, in the emotionalizing, your subconscious is feeding you all sorts of confirmatory data and you're just kind of swept along and it feels right. I mean, it feels compulsive, but it feels like the data are true. That's the best I can do. I'm not, uh, you have the same introspection that I do. So think about it yourselves. Uh, that's uh, it. Thank you very much.